This is Professor Matthew Sergi. This lecture will cover tone as a criterion that should be kept in mind by the majority of undergraduate writers about literature or in relation to literary interpretation more broadly. What follows is an extended version of material already included in the one-page handout on tone available in varied media, online, and in print associated with courses taught by me. Should the student watching wish to do so, she, he, or they may opt to utilize that handout in conjunction with the extended presentation included herein. I have been informed that this presentation has thus far been uh, a bit too cold and formal. Let's try sex. Now that I got your attention, let's talk about tone as a criterion that any undergrad in English classes or whatever should keep in mind. Before I start, you might have noticed that I'm repping my Thornstar t-shirt today. It says Thornstar using the letter Thorn, which we stopped using in English after the year 1500 or so. I'm a medievalist, so that makes sense. What did you think it said? Huh? <laughs> Any this lecture is a somewhat extended version of what is already included in my one-page handout on tone. Also copied at my webpage on tone where this video is embedded and where you may be watching this. Feel free to follow along with those as I talk. So, if you've received feedback from professors saying things like hasty, immature, sloppy, too formal, too informal, unprofessional, formulaic, cold, boring, stiff, stilted, or anything to do with proofreading issues, typos, etc., then this is a criterion that likely requires your attention. Scholarly writing can take many shapes. There are scholarly blogs, scholarly memoirs, scholarly tweets, scholarly po polemics, scholarly critiques of scholarly publications, scholarly comments on undergraduate papers, and indeed scholarly lectures on the subject of tone. Each of these requires a different tone. Some tonal choices are distinctly unscholarly, t-shirt, and thus better suited to non-scholarly situations uh, than a scholarly, sorry, better suited to non-scholarly situations than a scholarly tone might be. So what we're here to do today is to hone in on the best tone for an undergraduate essay about literature. And I will be blunt in that honing. I want you to think about the two not-so-effective ways I just tried to introduce this presentation. Many of my students' tones are way too close to the first one, even in their casual, off-the-cuff emails. They seem to be that stiff or stilted way, uh, almost as though I'm getting... I can I sometimes feel that you know students email me and I'm, I'm getting a letter about an audit from, from, from the tax people. <laughs> um, they seem to be that way because they are trying to get it right, you know, say things in the perfect way for a professor. But actually, they do quite the opposite. Um, dropping into the over-formal tone in the context of an English class, particularly in uh, indirect or uh, in, uh, in informal discourse, signals to me, right, as the listener, it's just a way of saying to the person who's listening to you, I am afraid of you, and you should be afraid of me. I am not interested in my listener's humanity, and I'm not interested in using my own humanity to read. So, tone communicates. Um, it's not just you have the content you want to say and then you put it in as formal where as you can for the moment. If you, if you overdress your tone or even make it so overdressed that it becomes impersonal, you're actually communicating something you probably didn't intend to. As for the second t-shirt kind, very few students come to me fully in that. So it has happened. But very few students come to me fully in the t-shirt style overly informal tone. But blips of it do appear in many students' little half-baked attempts to be cute or refreshing or clever, very often in the title of their paper, which throws in uh, a, a pun or something ostensibly to keep me awake. Uh, that signals to me and to my colleagues at various levels, uh, uh, subconsciously, semi-consciously, or consciously, it signals I need to make dumb jokes in order to keep interested in this otherwise boring subject, and you'll feel the same about my work. It's an intimidating realization. For any of my students who have turned to writing or the study of literature as a way to escape the pressures of social interaction, to find out that effective writing about literature, especially in the undergraduate essay, is a social interaction. It is a public speaking. 
and it requires many of the same skills that social interaction and public speaking do. There is a real person, a living person, receiving what you have written. But the nice thing and the calming thing about that is that this is a social interaction that you get to redo, rewrite, think about much ahead of time, edit and retune until it feels right, either from draft to draft on your own paper or from paper to paper across your university career. In fact, it may be in the end the kind of social interaction that builds confidence about social interactions more broadly. Using the correct tone, and here we're talking about the correct tone for an undergraduate essay about literature, there is the correct tone for any number of other situations, and tone is always determined by situation. Right? The correct tone is always determined by what fits a particular social situation as imagined in a work of writing, particularly in thinking about who the audience for that work of writing is. So using the correct tone is not about knowing some obscure set of stable rules, what to do, what not to do. In fact, trying to adhere to rules rather than develop a feel for tone is probably the worst thing you can do for tone. It would be like playing a piece of music just by the letter, or kissing by the book, we might say. If you are put off by or frustrated by the very idea that scholarly writing could be a practice that requires you to develop a feel for something, something that cannot be achieved just by adhering to prescribed rules and doing what you're told, then maybe humanity scholarship isn't a good fit for you. If so, that's okay, but the truth is that matters of feel and of heart and of rhythm are why we are here in this discipline. And the tone of our writing at the undergraduate level and above that reflects that. Tone in humanities writing and beyond is about knowing and thinking through the situation in which your work will be read. I'll here uh, introduce a quote from M. H. Abrams's Glossary of Literary Terms. Here Abrams is uh, quoting I. A. Richards and then expanding on it. He writes, in an influential discussion in 1929, I.A. Richards defined tone as the expression of a literary speaker's attitude to his listener. The tone of his utterance reflects his sense of how he stands toward those he is addressing. The sense in which the term is used in recent criticism is suggested by the phrase tone of voice as applied to non-literary speech. The way we speak reveals by subtle clues our conception of and attitude toward the things we are talking about, our personal relationship to our auditor, and also our assumptions about the social level, intelligence, and sensitivity of that auditor. The tone of a speech auditor, meaning audience here. The tone of a speech can be described as critical or approving, formal or intimate, outspoken or reticent, solemn or playful, arrogant or prayerful, angry or loving, serious or ironic, condescending or obsequious, and so on, through numberless possible nuances of relationship and attitude, both to object and to auditor. Again, nuances of relationship and attitude, both to the object and to the auditor, both to the text you're studying and to your audience. For our purposes as undergraduate writers about literature, let's get a simpler working definition of tone. Right? A working definition of tone, let's say the mood, atmosphere, impression, and feel constructed by a piece of writing, usually by means of choices and sentence structure and wording, but regardless of content, it's not what you say, but how you say it, which implies the writer's attitude to and opinion of the subject and audience. Right? So. Let's hone it down. Tone can vary in many ways, and here are three of them that I'd like you to think about. Formality, authority, and warmth. That's at least the, the three I find most helpful for undergraduate writing in the humanities. Formality can be on a sort of slider or spectrum from casual to formal, right? Author uh, I'm not saying that your writing should be on that spectrum. I'm saying that's how we think about what formality here means. Is it more casual or more formal? Authority, is it more tentative or more decisive? And warmth, is it more intimate or is it cold or legalistic or clinical or somewhere in between? So what are you shooting for in an undergraduate paper, tone-wise? In terms of authority for undergraduate essay writing, it's actually generally best to aim for one side of that spectrum, for a tone that is decisive, as long as you say only the truth. And that's something we would talk about on the criterion of rigor. 
the truth in literary studies, because the truth is inherently complicated, you're dealing with ambiguity, amb ambiguity, etc. Um, in literary studies, the truth itself will push you back naturally toward a more hypothetical tone, and so you are pushing against that to be decisive in what you're saying. You are trying to find things that you can say uh, in a decisive tone. In terms of formality, I'm sorry, warmth. In terms of warmth, first, um, the, uh, the thing you're shooting for is a firm handshake, right? You're not hugging your reader. You're, you're pushing for a firm handshake here. Let's say uh, uh, our, best, our best writing tends to flow equally well, well when it's read aloud. So this is why I encourage you to read your essays aloud when you can, especially to a human being in the room. Um, the best writing in humanities writing in general, including in undergraduate writing, gives the sense that the writer is present in the room, perhaps uh, speaking to us at the front of a classroom, for instance, not so close that it's like, hey, bro, but, right? um, but, but not close enough to hug, not close enough intimately to hug, but rather close enough to give a handshake, introduce yourself, and then sit down and discuss at a seminar table or in at a presentation what you're talking about. Again, uh, the warmth Right? It should not be so cold as it feels like you're speaking to us across a distant lecture hall or speaking to us through a screen or on television or in a doctor's office or in a legal proceeding. Right, That's not what we're going for. Uh, we're going for here the idea that we're sitting in a classroom together talking. Uh, and so that feeling like you're here with us, and that you're close to us but you're not up close, right, is the kind of warmth we're talking about. And that's most effective writing I've generally found in undergraduate and professional writing as well. Um, and what about formality, right? Formality we're aiming here for what we might say is business casual. And you'll see that um, most often your professors will quite literally dress uh, in business casual attire, uh, in the humanities at least. Uh, there's, there's of course, there are of course uh, exceptions to that. And at, at conferences and panels on conferences, we'll, we'll tend to do that in the professional world as well. Um, in this case, what I mean by that is, uh, is wording and sentence structure that is undeniably professional and undeniably mature, but in a relaxed and human way, not stiff or stilted, uh, not, not, not more formal than it would have to be to be in that situation, which allows for the free movement of new complex ideas and in clear and direct language, right? So if you think about it as sort of a job interview, right, you wouldn't show up for a job interview dressed too informally, but you wouldn't show up dressed too formally either. If you showed up in a tuxedo or even in a three-piece suit, if you're a man or in a, an evening gown if, if, uh, or, or whatever, um, this would be inappropriate for a job interview, right? Um, so if you think about that in terms of dressing for the occasion, uh, you can really think, uh, I've given you some tips here, uh, do not overdress, avoid inappropriate formality, avoid formulas and transition words, etc. Let, let's talk about this, right? It's, it's just as incorrect to show up to a black tie event in a ripped t-shirt and speedo, as it would be to show up at a high school beach party in a tuxedo. Remember that situation determines tone. You may rightly choose to crash either event, rebelling against their conventions, showing up at prom in a speedo, but it is narcissistic to expect the other event attendees to take you seriously in that case or hear you out if you have flouted the rules that they have accepted as customary. So unless your goal is to destroy conventions and reject etiquettes, which is sometimes a worthy goal, but not an effective one for convincing an audience about complex ideas in an undergraduate essay about literature, you have to adhere to the proper behavior for the space. So if you use the same formulas and transition words you used in high school, that's like wearing clothes that you've grown out of. If you are inappropriately formal, using buzzwords to make it sound, make things sound more sophisticated when the ideas themselves are not that sophisticated, it seems like you're wearing clothes that are not big enough for you. If you use overly flowery, flowery prose, clever puns, or words chosen, chosen for sound over meaning, or words you've chosen because you like the sound of them rather than because they're precise, that's like walking in wearing a funny t-shirt or a fake mustache, a sexually revealing outfit, or a lot of glitter. And above all, if you throw your paper together hastily, or if you miss spelling errors, usage errors, and typographical errors, that's mistypes, that's like showing up to a job interview with your fly open or a big stain on your shirt, pieces of underwear poking out, and so forth. Not only would you definitely not get the job, but your breach of etiquette would also rightly be interpreted as a gesture of disrespect and indifference. Proofreading. 
people think proofreading matters maybe because of uh, adhering to some some floating rule about grammar and whether but no it's it's the price of admission it's it's about being well dressed right it's the price of admission to any scholarly discourse right if you showed up uh, if I showed up to teach you a class and my fly was open, you would judge me and you would that, that, to that degree not be able to focus on, uh, on, what, uh, on what I was teaching you, right? So proofreading is really important because while uh, various tones are suitable to various discourses, no scholarly discourse uh, is suited to messiness. A late paper is often preferable to a messy one. You should never submit a paper that someone else has not looked over once. You should never submit a paper when your ability to see details is compromised, for instance, by lack of sleep. Nap first, then look over it again. If you're in a situation in which the paper will not be accepted unless exactly on time, you find it's 4 a.m. and that's the exactly on time, well, then I guess you've got to do it. But in most situations that are not that, uh, you should really consider whether it's worth taking a late penalty or handing in something just a tad late in order to make sure it's well proofread. Uh, that might have a positive effect not only on your grade, but also on how well your argument is heard. So we've said that tone is determined by audience, right, and determined by situation. It's also, right, we said tone, so know your audience. Right, um, as, uh, as we've sort of honed down from the Abrams, tone represents, right, so when you, the, the tone, the, the sort of the way your paper is dressed, represents your attitude to an opinion of your audience and of the subject you're studying. So how do you figure out what your audience is? Right? You're not really writing to your professor as a person when you're writing an undergraduate paper um, because your professor is trying to train you how to write for a broader audience. So in these situations, your professor is taking on, uh, through our training, the ability to stand in for a broader audience that they can then read on behalf of. Right. So you're not trying to please that professor with your tone directly either. Certainly not. Right. For every undergraduate paper I assign, I offer a suggested imaginary audience. And I think that this is actually a good rule of thumb for all undergraduate, I found at least, all undergraduate papers. The audience you're imagining yourself writing to is a group of graduate students and intelligent bloggers who have read your primary subject once and recently with full comprehension of its most prominent and basic meanings, but who do not have the text open in front of them. They have not read your supplemental texts, and they have taken related classes, but they have not taken your class. They assume that what you are discussing is significant, but not that what you are arguing is true. That's a complicated way of characterizing the audience, but it's a good rule of thumb for any undergraduate humanities paper. Let's break that down, right? If it's a group of graduate students and intelligent bloggers, they are not interested in learning anything from you that they can just as easily get by looking at Wikipedia or an online dictionary. They are not interested in being taught a breadth of material by an undergraduate about a subject they have already studied. So this is the wrong time to lecture us on broad course ideas unless you have been uh, instructed otherwise by your professor. What they will listen to eagerly but suspiciously is if you are arguing something that they did not already know or believe about a subject they know well. This is not your opportunity to teach or lecture to your audience. That would be inappropriate for this group, right? Uh, but it is an opportunity to make an argument about something small. Um, what about the fact that they have full comprehension of its most prominent and basic meanings? That means that they do not need to be reminded of anything about your subject, about your text, that most informed readers about of that text already know. A little summary of the text will result in, yes, we know, get to the point. But a lot of summary that takes up a big chunk of your paper will cause them, rightly, to disregard your thesis entirely when you finally get to it. Again, if you've been given instructions to the contrary for a particular assignment from a professor, follow those instructions. But if you haven't, this is a good rule of thumb. You're writing to someone who knows your text already, so you don't need to give information about what the text is, right? A lot of times, uh, people writing about, uh, let's say, the uh, medieval morality play, Mankind, will begin by saying, the medieval morality play, or even the the the, uh, the 15th century East Anglian morality play, Mankind, by an anonymous author, right? They add that at the beginning as though we need to announce that. But of course, if you're speaking to a group of graduate students and intelligent bloggers who have already read your primary subject with full comprehension of its most prominent and basic meanings, you don't want to lead with that. That's a bad foot to start on. 
but they do not have the text open in front of them. So they will often need you to provide direct quotations with citations so that they too can examine the nuances of the wording you're discussing. So you should be quoting directly wherever possible to provide hard evidence because again, this is a suspicious and learned audience. This audience has not read your supplemental texts. While they have certainly read whatever text it is that's important enough to be the center of your study, the one that's in your title, right? They will need you to contextualize references to secondary sources, but only as much as is necessary to relate them responsibly and thoughtfully to your points. And they have taken related classes, but not your class, right? So they don't care about your ability to parrot back or apply course concepts, and they will not trust any course concepts without citation. That's the difference between this audience and say writing to the professor directly, right? They're assuming that what you are discussing is significant. Why? Because if it weren't significant, they wouldn't be reading an essay about it and they would assume you wouldn't be writing one. They would not be reading an essay about something that was not significant in the first place. So making an argument that shows that any aspect of your subject is interesting or important or significant, right? If I've, I've seen papers that, that come to the conclusion that something is significant, uh, that would be painfully redundant, particularly to this audience. You should begin with an assumption of significance and importance and get on with analyzing what it signifies. But they are not assuming that what you are arguing is true. This is an audience that will not give you the benefit of the doubt because again, they would not be reading an essay about it otherwise. You need to use flawless logic to prove your points to this doubtful, suspicious, but also willing to be convinced audience. I hope that all makes sense. I hope the bluntness got the point across, and I thank you.